Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today we have a little bit of a different talk. We're going to sit down and have a roundtable discussion with Sparta Sports Science's Mike Hoffman, Wake Forest Ryan Horn, and Inside Trackers Carl Valley, and we're going to talk about force plates. We're going to get into a, a pretty neat talk, guys, and we're going to start out talking about the role that jumping places in our program, you know, and how it works with evaluating athletes and, you know, developing programs based on them. Uh, we're going to then get into why people select the tools that they utilize when it comes to uh, evaluating their athletes and where force plates fit in this. What are the really big pros of using this technology? We're then going to get into the return to play and monitoring fatigue and how force platforms fit into this. And, you know, Mike's got some really awesome stuff that he talks about here and how Ryan utilizes it is really neat. I, I thought that their back and forth was really cool there. And then we get into how these tools help build your athlete profile. You know, like Hank said the other day, it's how you build your profile of your athletes really determines how you train them. And then it also determines what you need to do for them to fit your team's profile. So that's really cool right there. And then how using force plates can add to the longevity of your athlete's career. And it can also alter the training that you do with them. And I think that that's really super important stuff. And then we, you know, we, we finish it out talking about how it allows for easy communication and increased motivation you know, to, to help the training be fun. It's an hour plus, guys. It's a ton of awesome information. I hope you take as much from it as I did. Let's get right to it. Fellas, thanks for being on today. Uh, just so everybody can know who's where, let's just run through quick and have a quick intro so everybody knows who they're talking with. Carl, let's start with you. Hey, this is Carl Valley. Uh, I'm with Inside Tracker, and I am the director of innovation, and basically a, a guy that helps connect the sports sciences to some of the pain points with teams. And we have a nice little uh, kind of a skunk works project where we do a lot of experimentation to see how all this stuff in sports science and, and sports data connects the dots between getting athletes to do things. Uh, to be more compliant and you know streamline things. So that's my role, and 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 I'm excited to be here. Awesome. And Michael? Yeah, this is Mike Hoffman from Sparta Science, and uh, I'm with business development and uh, former coach, and kind of like Carl was saying, connecting those dots from both a compliance standpoint, but also an understanding. Yeah. And Coach Horn. Ryan Horn, Director of Athletic Performance uh, for Men's Basketball at Wake Forest University. Um, I'm just here for the comments, trying to learn a little bit and, and push forward there and, and, and share a little bit. But uh, I really just wanted to, to get face-to-face -face with Carl. So that's really my, that's really my goal right now. Awesome. Well, yeah, so if we're going to sit here and, and talk force plates, I think the best place to start is uh, talking about vertical jumps. So... Let's, uh, let's start there. Let's talk about vertical jump and, and everything associated with it and how that leads to our programming and decision making. Yeah, I think, I think it's good for the listeners and the viewers to, uh, to narrow the scope that this conversation and this roundtable is about just trying to take uh, vertical jumping in all the forms, whether it be uh, counter movement, non-counter movement, you know, like a traditional squat jump, uh, single leg and, and all of those type of options just up and down because of the practical side of, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to get athletes to repeat the, the quality of movement over and over versus something that requires just a, a little bit more comp, uh, moving parts such as the horizontal jumps, whether that obviously you can do some of those things, um, but we're going to narrow the scope on force plates and basically what information we can tease out of just jumping, whether it be just testing large groups quarterly to see how training is improving or using it to kind of try to sneak a peek into the nervous system and fatigue. Yeah, that's great. So I don't know if, if many people are familiar with um, our vertical jump assessment, the movement signature, uh, it's six vertical jumps. And from there, the three variables we look at are average eccentric rate of force, um, average concentric force, and vertical impulse. And a lot of people always ask, well, why those three? And the first study we did about seven years ago now was 
on what variables from the vertical jump are reliable. Um, and those three were the most reliable. In fact, the eccentric force, which we just call load, because it's a lot easier to explain to a coach, load versus average eccentric rate of force, um, was 0.98 reliable. Uh, explode was 0.97. And then that concentric impulse or that, that what we call drive uh, was 0.88, which as you guys know in stats, anything over 0.7 is significant. So I think before... You know, you can do any assessment you want on the force plate, but first you got to find something that's reliable, and that's where people kind of miss the boat. It's like GPS variables. You can get 200 variables, um, but what's the variables that are ultimately robot reliable and then going to impact what you do um, from an action standpoint? So that's where we kind of narrowed in over the last seven years on these three variables and then ultimately how they interact with each other. So I think a good um, transition is to talk about probably the number one thing, and this is on force plate specifically, um, probably what are common workflows to integrate uh, basically jump analysis into different types of teams, whether it be a large uh, football program at a D1 institution to something smaller such as what Ryan and, and Jay uh, experience with basketball because obviously the, the size is a lot smaller um, yep. and uh, the also the schedule I mean there's a difference between playing weekly right you know that the, the professional soccer clubs and uh, American football that's a weekly rhythm versus you know something as dense as an NBA season so with college basketball it'd be really cool to hear this is just my opinion on how Ryan and, and this is just uh, uh, mainly jump testing, we can get into the force play stuff on the next round, yeah. but if Jay could share kind of how he does power testing, he's using an, a linear positional transducer, um, Ryan's obviously using a whole bunch of stuff, so he has more, more options. I would love to hear from Ryan first about how he decides to decide the frequency um, and and, and just getting the data. We can talk about analysis later, but I really like the procedures and kind of the workflows discussion first because that's the number one thing. How do we get people tested? Because the, the value of the data is high, but the demand besides the cost of, uh, of, of uh, the technology is something in terms of a timeline, what people really want to uh, talk about. So Ryan, if you could go right into the discussion about how you get the, the testing done in a, an applied setting. Yeah, I think it's big to understand too. I mean, we took, you know, over a year. I think I was discussing with Mike for about a year um, and looking at different options for us uh, to include some form of, of jump testing uh, into our protocols. In, in the past, we have done jump mat testing. Uh, we've used, you know, Jim Aware for testing and looking at that. And one, and one of the issues I was seeing is, and what attracted me to using the force play was not so much just pure amplitudes of what our guys were able to hit. Uh, but mechanically, how were they expressing those forces uh, and finding gaps in that protocol to look at more than just a baseline number of what a guy's jumping at and then looking at you know, a relative base of what his fatigue are because the, the shift for me as far as what I was looking at with my workflow, uh, I wasn't getting as much information uh, that I would like to have. Um, so when I decided to kind of plunge into the force plate, one thing I liked about it, um, we try to test every seven to ten days. Uh, that's what we look at. Um, you know, it's a jump sport, so my guys are jumping constantly. Uh, but with the six, uh, the six jumps is a low volume to what we're doing. We do it on our first lift day of the week, uh, which is usually our most intensive day. Um, and then I think the biggest thing for us is kind of integrating it. It hasn't been really. It's probably the most seamless that we've done as far as looking at it and how it's set up and how we analyze it and how we get the numbers. The guys are motivated by it. Uh, when I told them, hey, you jumped 26 inches today and yesterday you jumped 25 and a half, they didn't really connect the dots, so to speak, um, as a result of the training process or as a result of fatigue, um, we were starting to speak the same language. Uh, and I saw that almost immediately uh, after our first scan uh, when the guys came from Sparta uh, and came down and we took our guys through it. A lot of what we've been seeing was validated through our scans. Uh, and I think that was exciting for me. It was exciting for our coaching staff. Um, so from that standpoint, I think it's been huge um, to do that. We've actually, unfortunately, had the ability to do it with a return to play as well. Um, so that was another piece of it. 
um, to be able to see the difference between just a normal weekly scan and a guy that's coming back um, from an injury. Um, so we've kind of seen all spectrum so far in the short amount of time. We've been using it since November. Um, so, you know, we're still learning. Uh, you know, I think I'll know more at the end of the year. I'm not going to say right now that's the, the greatest thing since sliced bread has completely changed our program, but it has provided us a new lens to look through. It has provided us with some perspective. Um, and I think at the end of the season, when we look at all the things that we're doing right now and trying to streamline that and find what's reliable for us, I think that's a big word you've already used. As a coach that's in the that's, that's in the fire, so to speak. I look for reliable, um, and, and we look at valid as long as I'm consistent with what I'm doing, and I can look at it and uh, make those choices from it, and it's driving a little bit of our decision-making process. I think it's valid for us, um, and I think there's a lot of different ways to do things, but when it came to me, I wanted something that was simple, uh, something that was I could repeat uh, weekly, and I can depend on that I know it could be consistent. Uh, so from that standpoint, our workflow, it hasn't really been, I mean, honestly, it's a, it, we just replaced it with our warm up once a week. Um, so we do the standardized warm up and we jump. Um, so it's been, it's been, it's been easy from that standpoint. Our situation here is obviously a little different and a lot of it comes uh, down to the fact that the last two years, you know, we've gone through our conference half of the season playing five, six, seven guys tops. Um, so really, evaluating fatigue um, hasn't been our main focus because, to be honest, if kids are playing 30 minutes a night, you're pretty sure that they're fatigued. So we don't do much off-court training at that point. It's more just about recuperative stuff with those guys. Uh, the last test we took was the week after we were down in Winston-Salem. Um, and we do a lot of stuff traditionally with a vertex or with you know a tape measure uh, but we do do a bunch of stuff with the gym aware you know looking at the two different jumps with that um, but to be completely frank the reason we look at it uh, is twofold one to make sure we're improving and two uh, is our return to play and that whole idea it was 100 percent not my idea it came from our sports medicine guy who's I mean, he's, he's a billion times smarter than I am. He's absolutely phenomenal. But we sat and watched a lecture one day, and uh, what was brought up was the whole idea that, you know, the hop stop, you know, you're looking at 95% of X, you know, your right leg versus left. But at the end of the day, who, who really cares about that, right? Because 95% of X for Ryan Horn is going to be different than Carl versus Mike versus Jay. So. We need to know where we left off so we can get to that, again, I don't know the word, like the retrained, you know, reconditioned, whatever yeah. is the new cool term that we want to use for that. Um, so you know that they actually are back. Um, but yeah, it's that's just something that we're, we do that, that kind of makes me look smart, but really it's somebody else's work completely that I'm just kind of robbing. Yeah. Well, Jay, and I think this is a good maybe uh, topic for, for Mike to share, is one of the common things with getting baseline data is that in the future, whether if something was supposed to, something bad happens, you have something to compare it to, or it's also a benchmark of where you are at that point, so hopefully a year later, you're better. Um, with, obviously, the Sparta science is dissecting the vertical jump and, and getting those small parts of the force time curve. It'd be really cool to talk about um, asymmetry. Um, obviously, uh, when someone has an injury, uh, then the likely comparison is what's happened uh, compared to the healthy leg. Now, that's a problem because um, it was really cool. I was at a conference, and uh, they showed Cam Newton, and they showed him after he got his like knee scoped or whatever, and they showed that the uh, performance of the previously injured leg was higher um, in terms of like just global power but uh, because they trained that leg and focused on that that leg versus the athlete as a whole and then things kind of caught up when he started doing more of the traditional return to play versus that early rehab that you do yeah. uh, Mike this might be a good thing yeah. to discuss um, you know uh, a return to play strategies and right and left symmetries um, and what they mean a, a good yeah. 
example of this would probably be the Nord board, where um, the research shows that it's better to be strong and let your nervous system fine tune things between right and left versus have really good symmetry and be weak as a baby's fart. You know, yeah. that's Hold what people are, are kind of talking about is uh, yeah. symmetrically <laughs> low performance yeah. is not as good as the body having some resources to work with. Yeah. No, that's, and, and to be honest, Carl, with that, we see that a lot too of when we go on site and do our return to play left versus right, their injured limb is actually stronger and stiffer because the, that's the leg they're focusing on. Um, and as a result, the other leg is actually um, hindered a little bit because it hasn't been priority. But kind of how, how we match it up with our athletes here is is the left versus right is just one score. And then we have a strength score. Um, from our program and which could be like your nor board example um, and then we tie that in with the surgeon clearance so we almost have like a no participation limited full participation which you know that's where it gets fun is like you know jay you guys have a set protocol and this is just one tool to objectively match up with your protocol you know i use the analogy of the force plate's just a needle the software is just a blood machine and then jay's a different doctor versus carl versus ryan versus me and then this is just seeing if your treatment's working ultimately and validating what you're doing. It's not changing what you're doing. That's great. I think uh, we've had a couple examples um, with that. Only my personal example as well. I was kind of surprised when Mike came in. I got a torn labrum in my right hip, and uh, we did our single leg landing test, and I outscored on that on that injured hip, which I found, you know, at first it was kind of like one of those things where uh, I was expecting uh, to see a bigger difference between my sway balance and my landing on that leg, but I had the same um, the same type of result as far as what we were looking at with that side. Now I have another guy, uh, you know, and once again, previous injury is going to be the greatest predictor of future injury. Uh, and he had a, a foot injury in high school uh, and re-injured that foot. Uh, and in his return to play process, it was a little bit more predictable in the sense when we started looking at progressing him we wanted to find something that he could do um, to give us a baseline for which to work off so using our catapult data and our gp sports data looking at player load and what we found uh, with him is to have some type of logical return to play process especially with like a broken foot uh, in that sense the rehab protocol is pretty much x-ray look at it how are you adapting okay let's move on to the boot you move on to the boot how's that feeling okay let's go 50 50 x-rays look good now you're walking in a normal shoe how does that feel you go through so the rehab protocol itself um, can be very broad and very general but looking at that athlete specifically uh, what are his baselines as far as his volume is concerned so using our athlete tracking our wearables where was he at uh, before the previous injury then using the force plate to kind of match up that data to look at limb to limb. Uh, the one great thing I love about uh, the plate is you can't cheat it. Um, you, you, you know, and you can't, I don't care what you do, how you do it. Um, it's going to look at when his first test, he just did not want to stiffen up and put force on that foot and put it in there. Now, when we look back at it, he had some clearance to do some things I probably would not want him to do at that point going from zero to 100 because the clearance is like, okay, let's get back to activity. Um, but when we looked at those limb discrepancies and the strengths and the stiffness, it was only an extra 10 days, but the extra 10 days, I felt like in that time frame with his scans and being consistent, uh, it provided us a little bit more direction and clarity integrating with the sports medicine staff, which we know at the collegiate level can be great or it can be you know, issues and gaps in that communication, but to have a number uh, to show the surgeon and to show the athletic training staff and to show the director of sports medicine, we started to speak in the same language. So from my position, uh, that's been fantastic to kind of validate what we're doing uh, in a return to play protocol, but then to giving them something we can have some kind of common ground um, to discuss and progress as needed. So we've seen some cool things as far as our guys uh, with the tracking, our guys with the highest player loads and the highest mechanical load during practice are also our biggest producers on the force plate. Uh, and they're also the most sensitive on the force plate as well when it comes to increases in intensity or frequency. Uh, so those things itself has been, you know, to build off what Mike is saying, uh, different situations, different places, uh, but to have that ability to do that uh, has been fantastic. Jay, I have just, just a question to you. Uh, knowing that all this information you're getting from any type of test is a good discussion point with 
uh, your head coach for like for example, you might be playing your starters and maybe one guy off the bench a lot. The lack of testing, meaning uh, just jumping alone, if a guy's banged up and too tired and doesn't have the willing energy to test, it's not a really a lack of data. It's the fact is if you can't get that protocol in place, it's a wonderful opportunity to explain to the coaches who make the final say, hey, we need to find a way either to you know uh, recruit more or uh, find a way to get deeper recovery because it might make sense for the team coach to say, hey, I can't get a huge amount of uh, people on the recruiting process. I need to get, you know, it's better to have more horses than donkeys. On the other hand, as a strength coach and athletic training, um, you, you basically have to manage athletes that are on that edge of injury. Mm -hmm. um, with jump testing being, if a guy has jumper's knee, for example, that's kind of prohibitive to add more piling on more stress. Maybe it'd be a cool idea to talk about things such as uh, a little bit less demanding. I think the postural sway analysis is a wonderful opportunity to see if you're riding a guy that's been kind of nursing an injury on the ankle. Mm -hmm. It'd be pretty cool to look on the medical side of the force plate versus just the absence of power. What mm -hmm. about yeah. throwing that in yeah. there, um, Mike yeah. and uh, and Jay? And Jay, you first probably. No, and I don't. I don't disagree, nor would I argue with any of that. But the one thing that I would say is. The other ways that we do monitor and, and evaluate our kids um, has just shown that what the guy upstairs does is he handles them well. You know, I mean, it's there's a reason that they can bounce back and play another 30, 35. I mean, shoot, we had, again, we had three or four guys play 40 plus last night because he handles them well in practice. You know, and it it's something that, you know, knock wood, we're either doing really well or we've just been lucky, you know, and maybe they're synonyms, um, but he, uh, he, he does do well with it. So and do I think that that could be a good idea? Certainly. Do I think that at this point it would be a necessity? Probably not. Um, and I, and at times... I like to take a step back and, and just say that am I going to bring more to them that they don't need at this present moment? And if that's what you're doing and you're kind of flooding them with stuff that doesn't really matter at that point, are you going to lose their attention for what you need to talk about later? You know what I mean? No, that's, sure. that's great, Jay. And I think, you know, that's we what we see too. You have your old school coaches that are like we don't care we trust ryan and what he's doing in the weight room he doesn't need to tell me you know so i think those type of guys are just trying to control what they do in the weight room and then almost put the e-brake on when the head coach is gonna you know drive full speed and the guy's not ready to drive full speed so with those type of people it's almost you know hootie says it best in one of the blogs she wrote of just sniper shotting what they're doing in the weight room because whether his gps or whatever is high on the court it doesn't matter because coach self's going to run them regardless you know, so just controlling what she can control in the weight room and ultimately, hopefully, you know, maybe the force plate's one tool that will help direct the effort she's going to do. Oh, no doubt. And it, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I think Ryan could probably contribute quite a bit here too, but I, I you know, I, I think that that whole idea with what Andrea was saying is, is perfect. You know, I mean, even if it isn't, you know, going to be specifically in the weight room. I mean, what if it's just stuff that we're doing on the court different for those six or seven cats when we warm up, you know, okay. I mean, we, we could talk about other monitoring methods for hours. I mean, this, this thing could be a 24 hour discussion. You know, I just don't have the bandwidth to put it online. You know, <laughs> yeah. we're going to go into to all of these things, but I think that that's, you know, another way to look at, pretty similarly to what we're doing. I mean, I could be wrong, though. I mean, Ryan, how do you see that? I think context is everything. I mean, I know Mike brought up Hootie and her situation and what she's dealing with. Um, your head coach is going to determine what you can do uh, and what kind of voice you're going to have and the say you're going to have in the development process from a practice standpoint. 
you know, I think one thing we need to understand too is, you know, what I do is, a, and what we do as a staff is complementary in nature. Um, it needs to complement what our head coach is doing. It needs to complement uh, what our guys are specifically going through. In my experience, it's been a lot easier to establish thresholds and to establish productive conversations with our coaching staff when we have something tangible to look at. Um, so when we get in season, we're not trying to use a machine gun and use, you know, like for me, uh, HRV for me in season, while it has been productive, I can't get my guys consistently at eight o'clock in the morning, every morning. I, I, I just can't. Uh, and it's just part of our academic schedule at a smaller private institution. I need to find ways that are reliable and that are easily adjusted for our guys schedules and to get done. I can do 10 different things, but what our coach wants to see. So we've streamlined with the plate, uh, we've streamlined with some velocity-based training stuff that we're doing in the weight room. Then, of course, with our wearables and then our sport view data for in-game, which, Jay, you know, you've seen some of that stuff as well. Um, we found some correlations between our guys' productivity both on the court. Now, we play more bodies. Our rotation is bigger. Um, so, yeah, our guys, you know, we have a big team, so, you know, we're not necessarily experiencing uh, as many minutes per game uh, per se. Um, but for us, I think it all comes back to conversation. You know, I think it's one thing we look at, okay, you do the jump testing. You know, we've had guys that had some patellofemoral knee pain, some jumpers knee, some things of that nature. Um, and after doing some scans on the plate and looking at how mechanically, how are they expressing these forces and seeing what they're doing, we've made adjustments within our program. Uh, to drive some of those indicators up and to explain some of the things that we're doing. Uh, and it's probably stuff that I should have been doing before that I know I should have been doing, but I've just overlooked and haven't really put as much attention into it. Um, and I think it kept me honest as well uh, and held me accountable um, for what we're doing. Because for me, I love doing the, the fun stuff. I love seeing my guys move. I love doing the Olympic lifts and strength movements and bilateral work. And those are things we love to do. But there were some guys that were having some issues, whether it's previous injury history uh, or just a result of what they were doing, that that just wasn't the right menu for them at that point. So what we try to do is we didn't change everything. We're here for a reason, uh, but we use the information that we had to complement uh, what we were already doing. And, and the ends are going to justify the means. Our injury reports, our daily treatment schedules, things are changing. Uh, and I don't know if that's necessarily a result of us managing some things better in practice or in the weight room, but I believe those conversations have been more productive with the head coaching staff and the medical staff. So things are getting seen, things are getting changed. Uh, and it gives us a little bit more in our toolbox for which to work with. Depending if a guy does have a rolled ankle, then he can do sway balance and, and look at that. And that gives us a non-invasive metric that we can look at that we already have a baseline on to see if anything has changed and have some type of dialogue where he's consistent with what we're doing. Um, but I think for me, you know, I want to be involved. You know, we want to establish those thresholds. You know, Coach Manning is the expert. and He's going to devise the practice schedule as such. And we've been working together for a long time. Um, but having more information and information that I know is consistent and reliable that I can message him with um, is going to be much more productive um, in the long-term sense. And I, just piggybacking off that, I think that the really the most important part of that is you've been with Coach Manning for a while, so you know exactly what he's doing. I've been with Coach Mooney for 11 years. I, I can tell you right now exactly what practice is <laughs> to. Yeah, I mean. 95% to what practice is going to be yeah. like in an hour and 40 minutes you know yeah. so it's when you understand what these kids are what they are really and what they're going through and, and what it's going to be hopefully you know 11 years in we've figured out how to prepare them for it you know yeah. so we can kind of just build off it that way but yeah I, I, I think the communication obviously is vital but then secondly that that relationship and just the time. I mean, to understand I mean, so Carl, you, you kind of alluded to it as well with the profile as far as horses and donkeys. It's funny to mention that because of the numerous teams that we've spoke with that use similar technology in their program, their scans are reflective of the recruiting. Uh, what type of athletes <laughs> yeah. they want? No, I, I, what type of athletes they want to bring yeah. in? Whether it's a, you know, a different team that presses, that's a very linear team that's going to run the floor that doesn't really rely as much on lateral quickness and ball screen offense and things like that. You know, Coach Manny rec recruits versatile players. You can ask Mike, when we did our scans, it was pretty much consistent across the board with what our guys looked like. Uh, we had very, from big men to, to guards or who anything else, they fit a very specific profile. Um, and I think that has to go with well as knowing that I have high twitch, 
lateral quickness guys that their greatest blessing is also their biggest curse. So when we look at certain things like that, we're able to look at that profile and validate and show coach, these are the type of athletes you're bringing in. This is the type of signature that they have, and it mimics the style of play that we have. Same thing goes with catapult or GP sports or tracking data. When I look at the type of athletes that different coaches are bringing in, and I ask them about their practice data, it's reflective to the system of which they run. Uh, Mike Curtis down at UVA, they hold the ball for 25 seconds. They're going to hold the shot clock. You look at the sport view data and some different things we were faster we hit higher top speeds we move we cover more ground than they did it's just a different demand so his numbers on a tracking or his numbers on a force play is going to be very specific to the type of athlete that he's working with just the same as with what we have you know we have a seven foot one guy that's 265 pounds that has a middle finger scan that's quick twitch as can be uh, so you can't train him like some of our foreign guys that we have from Greece that's a straight linear build momentum and then tumble down the court. Uh, he's an outlier from our team, and he doesn't yeah. match up to what we have. He's a shooter, so he doesn't need to do as much there, but it's reflective in the way he plays and the way he, do th- the way he does things. It's reflective in the scan as well. So a lot of the things that we are seeing, a lot of the nicks and the knocks and the little tweaks guys were have were reflective of what their scans looked like. And Mike has some great information, some great data as far as different injury potential and injury risk via those scans based on millions of scans that they've done and the data that they have. And it's been pretty pinpoint with some of the stuff that we've experienced with our squad as well. So I think from that, once again, you know. Well, I think, I think what we could do on the, on these, on the next two rounds of, of uh, discussion points is the first thing is the, you know, either we use the term here at inside tracker, you know, extreme personalization. So you're not only getting not all the specifics of the athlete, it's the system that they're running and the moment in time that you're working with them. You know, exactly. something in the off season is going to be completely different uh, than in season, even though it's the same athlete, they might not be the same person throughout the season. Hopefully. So I think what really interesting is to talk about which everyone's mentions all the time is everyone's a unique snowflake. But then when you see practices, everyone looks like clones. So it'd be cool to talk about, um, these two concepts, which is how do you integrate um, other things to have a, a, a better uh, synergy of the data? Um, like, for example, heart rate variability might not be great in season because of the academics. Mm-hmm. But conversely, the opposite might be true is where some of these other technologies, exactly. uh, like questionnaires, although subjective questionnaires aren't perfect, you can use them to tease out, for example, willingness to train might be really low. And maybe their scans are basically the same profile, mm-hmm. but maybe the uh, absolute values are just lower. And it might not be necessarily the weakness. It might just basically, you know, travel fatigue and their heads are just lost. So it'd be cool to talk, um, if you could, Mike first and then Jay and yeah. Ryan, how you take other data and fuse it together to, to get more out of it. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think... You know, there's twofold. There's the integration with other technologies, whether it be Omega Wave or, you know, when I was in South Africa, they were sucking in their Omega Wave into a dashboard with force plate scans and different timing. Like there's an example of an SEC basketball guy that went to SEC Media Days and his drive or his vertical concentric impulse increased by 50 T scores overnight. And it's because he got back from SEC media days at 2 a.m. and they scanned him at 6 a.m. Well, Coach Howland held him out of practice for three days and it dropped 50 T-scores. And it's not because it increased because his glutes and hamstrings got stronger so he could carry out extension longer. It's because he was fatigued and wanted to spend more time on the ground. So that's where, you know, people's scans can change, whether it be from fatigue or from validating the program that the doctor, Ryan or Jay, prescribed. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, we we don't take as many physical metrics throughout the year. Um, We track a lot of game data. Yeah, We're really lucky here in that we've got a kid who who went to Princeton who was doing analytical work in the financial sector who all of a sudden was like, I want to get into basketball. So he's down here crunching numbers. and putting together all these great charts and graphs and all the stuff that I was doing before, except those are really neat and they're 
pretty and <laughs> you actually cute. can tell what they're trying to tell you as opposed to <laughs> yeah. uh, my Excel, you know. Your, your master's in Excel? Yeah, my, my Excel stick figures that I was drawing. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, it, it is. And it's a lot, a lot of the time, like I said earlier, we, what we see is, is what we thought we would see and what we hope we would see. And that is that coach does a good job man you know, yeah. that's why you know ryan was was here this summer and that's why when althoff said it during his talk i i giggled you know and all the work and all the data that they collect and all the numbers that they bring in just showed that their, their coaches know what they're doing exactly and it's you know there, there's a reason why they get paid what they get paid um and it's it's just yeah. been more of a reinforcing factor than it has been of a um, of a conflicting factor. Yeah, and and with that too, with the workouts, what we're finding running the stats on you know workouts based on locations is the main movements that increase the variables are the movements everyone's been doing for hundreds of years: squat, deadlift, you know, all those clean, all those movements that we've known. But how did we objectively show that we knew? You know, without just reading a book that said they did it back in Greece. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, last week, or two weeks ago, Hank was on, and uh, he was talking about that exact same thing. He's like, listen, there's some things that work. They worked 3,000 years ago, and we still do them. Like, yeah. when we do them 3,000 years later, if it was a waste of time? I mean, the answer to that is obviously no. You know, yeah. so it's, everybody wants to uh, try to, you know, throw something new in the pot, but Hey man, chili's chili, you know. It <laughs> doesn't matter what extra ingredients you throw in; it's, it's going to be good. So, I mean, I don't know how you guys see it down there, Ryan. I mean, I think when you look at it, uh, it's one of those things where you know I think it'd be easy for us to say, you know, you know, I know what coach is going to do. You know, I'm not necessarily going to track or do certain things, but I think that there's comes a moment when you need it is when you have to have it. Uh, and I think from that standpoint, it's like anything else, like tracking a bank account. Do you need to have a budget? Do you need to keep track of what you're spending? Probably not. But when time comes, when you strike zero and you overdraw your account, that's when you need it. So in a sense of return to play, uh, a sense of a guide developing over the time. Now, if you call me in about two months when the season's over and I have had time to let this stuff kind of digest and process and, and, and kind of look at what we're seeing. But we are seeing some things where, yeah, we know if guys play significant minutes, they're going to have issues with fatigue. We understand that. Uh, but I think if we can find ways to continue to accumulate information to work back off to help ourselves in the future, whether it's with performance each week, you know, we're looking at sport view data and looking at, you know, games that we've won and games that we've lost and our productivity physically, there's been a move in how we're performing this and the speeds that we're hitting, the change of direction, things of that nature. So, I think for me, it's one of those things where we have these conversations daily. We have these conversations weekly. We've got into a rhythm. Uh, we're starting to test our guys. Everything's not perfect. You know, we have access to some things that we just don't use uh, because it's just not beneficial at this point. But we've been consistent uh, with our force plate scans. We've been consistent with athlete tracking on a daily basis. And we're continuing to establish these levels and these baselines for which we can work off and make daily and weekly adjustments. Uh, and I think those are things for us when something does does go wrong do we have the information to work back and look at to make sure it doesn't happen again now is every situation the same athletes are constantly trained or constantly changing and adapting to the stimulus of which we're placing on them but if we can have a little bit more information to increase our efficiency with our interventions i think it's a long-term step when we look at development over a three four five-year process it's invaluable not to have that information you know to have that information so I think it just depends, once again, on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve. Um, but I don't really see any downfall of including it within the program, so to speak. Yeah, well, I, I'll just give you kind of some real working examples. Um, I think as the development of the athlete gets higher in their career later into going from adolescence to perhaps pro, if they do have the, the mm -hmm. genetics, in the, in the environment to, to grow there. Um, I think it's really important that we discuss um, the long-term development because what's happened is AAU basketball has been getting hammered that kids now are going, they're like basically mini professionals uh, with the same schedules. Yeah. 
forbid you actually train and be disciplined and, and, and not getting that instant feedback of uh, the instant gratification of, of competition. I think it'd be really important to talk about um, basically what is the role of, of, of what you're getting in college, because I think college is a special time. Um, I think high school, it varies from, you know, some brilliant coaches to sometimes someone just basically uh, him or her just filling the position just to keep the program running. So, you know, I don't want to be critical because I coached high school for years and, you know, that's basically a, a toss up to something amazing or something that's been actually more harm than good. Um, I think it'd be great to talk about what you're trying to do to help develop the athlete versus just keep them going. It's almost like people think that college is the middle of the baton passing of the four by one, where you're getting someone from high school and you're just trying to pass them on. And I think that attitude's made everyone almost into a, uh, a conservative holding pattern where people are afraid to train. And, you know, people are afraid to get work done. You know, we, we see a lot of that with a lot of college basketball because it's a lot of one and done um, with the bigger programs. And that starts with the, the high school or the uh, private schools where everyone's just sort of babying the, 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 the talent. And then when they go into the pros, they have a training age of zero and a lot of mileage on their bodies. So maybe we can talk about, you know, just how... Uh, force plates help preserve the length of a career when you're just running back and forth on the hardwood. So from a, a career longevity standpoint, it'd be great for Mike and then Jada to, to kind of talk about those things. Well, actually, I'm going to add to that, and then I'm going to step out of the question. And I'm going to say, not only does how does it add to longevity, but how does it alter planning? As in, with with the data that is selected now, and Ryan touched upon a couple of freaking super awesome points earlier, but like, Mike, like, what do you see? Because like, what Ryan sees is what Ryan sees. But like, you see everything. So what do you see? And it doesn't just have to be hoops, man. I mean, honestly, yeah. I, I don't care if it's yeah. ice hockey or freaking squash. Like, yeah. <laughs> what does? What does this information now cause as an adjustment in this long-term development uh, protocol? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's twofold. I think back to Carl's initial point. Our international partners they use it more um, for that longitudinal tracking because it is only six vertical jumps. They track their academy guys all the way up to their first team. Um, and the second thing, I think, you know. The perfect example is the Jaguars are scanning at the Senior Bowl this week in Mobile. And what we're seeing is, you know, it's it's really validating good strength coaches because if you're a football guy, you're spending four years of, you know, at least three times a, a week with that guy. Um, so it's it's twofold. We're, we're seeing it both, you know, there's the, the NFL team see it as talent ID. Um, and like you were saying, at the pro level, Carl, they don't really train. Um so their big thing is like talent ID. Is this guy's ceiling higher than this guy's or is this guy's risk for injury higher than this guy's? It's not necessarily, can we, can we change the, how those three variables are interacting, which is probably how Ryan's seen it more from what he can control in the weight room. Um, so I think it's twofold. I think with the vertical jumps, you can track it longitudinally because it is such a small stressor. Um, but then also, you know, back to the talent ID of, if a guy's more balanced, he's going to be able to reproduce those forces and be more efficient. So his longevity, you know, at the pro level with our pros that train here, we're trying to get them to be more efficient with their energy because their 1RM is long gone as far as their max strength was better when they were 25 rather than 33, you know. So we're just trying to – that repeated uh, force output is more important to us and being more efficient for that longevity. Well, that's pretty awesome. So then, then piggybacking off that, to, is that similar to what you see, Ryan? Yeah, I think when you look at, you know, we've talked about it before, Jay. I, I haven't been blessed yet to have too many uh, one and dones. I uh, actually haven't had any. Uh, so I, have, I haven't really had to, be, you know, be in that situation yet. Uh, it might be a welcome change in the future. But right now I haven't had to really deal with that. So I'm getting my guys for an extended period of time. But uh, Carl touched on it before. I mean, these guys are coming in. They're playing 50, 60 games a year. Um, and they're coming in, they're weak, they're underfed, and they're overworked. 
Um, so when those guys come in, I say that all the time, but it's something you have to manage and understand it's not a part of the culture. In football, and you've already alluded to, you're spending 60% of your year preparing. We're spending 90, I think we talked about it before, Jay, 92 or 93% of our year is practicing and competing. Um, so the window for off-season development is anywhere from 8 to 10 weeks, if you're lucky, depending on your school's summer school schedule. So you're in a constant state of juggling these stressors and juggling these demands. But what we see when guys come in, low training age guys, you know, and Mike can talk about this a little bit more, but they can't load. Their maximal strength is low. They can't load. When they go to explode, a lot of our guys are twitchy and they're reactive, elastic, but they come in, they have an approach jump of 40 plus inches, but you put them on two feet, you have them jump in the air and they're starting strength and their ability to load and not leak out uh, when they transfer those for forces is, is minimal at best. And I think that sets them up for long term to be able to be resilient enough to handle those demands uh, we have to load them in a certain way to be able to basically promote that resilience and promote those developments over a longer period of time so for us that's reflective of training age our young guys come in their loads not as good usually their explodes pretty decent because we recruited that uh, and their drive sucks uh, because they don't have any posterior chain mobility, they don't have any posterior chain strength, and they haven't been a part of a structured training program. So from that standpoint, you're starting at ground level um, to develop these guys, but you're looking at these tendencies uh, to try to formulate a plan that is not only specific to the demands of basketball and the positional requirements, but also, but also athlete-centric as well to develop these guys. Like I had a guy that right now that we scanned that I thought was a nightmare. He doesn't move very well. Uh, he moves well, but he's had issues with um, some right knee pain and some issues in high school growing up. Um, I thought he'd be one of our worst scanners and he was one of our most resilient. Uh, he's a master compensator. He can jump out the gym. He can do some things. And sometimes uh, the old adage, if it looks right, it flies right, doesn't really apply to him. Uh, but he's super athletic. He gets things done and he's effective. Um, so I think we have to look at that and kind of provide context of what we're trying to see. But the more information you have over a long-term period, the more efficient you're going to be able to develop those athletes because you're taking out a lot of variables and you're streamlining your approach. Has my program changed a whole bunch? No. Have we made some adjustments and some small wrinkles within the program to help some of those individuals develop more? Yes. And have we seen changes in the numbers? Yes. Are our guys more compliant to the things that we're asking them to do as a result of the change? Yes. So when you see those things and that validation of not only what we know, but what we can prove and what we can show. So over a long term period, it's important to have that information and have that data to really, you know, build a resilient athlete. We're not in a great situation, but I welcome it uh, with the amount that our athletes are under and the amount of stress that makes things fun and makes it interesting. Uh, and I think we can develop from that standpoint, but it's something that has to be looked at, especially with the type of athletes that we're working with. And, and I think just to, to wrap up this, this great conversation, um, I think you, you kind of hit it on the head, Ryan, with, you know, you use the F word, fun. Um, no. The issues I've been seeing is that, you know, and I mentioned this probably, I don't know, almost six or seven years ago, a kid uh, is going to be going to high school and foam rolling for four years. Then they go to college and foam roll for four years. And when they're a 10 year veteran in the league, they foam roll for 20 years now. So how do you make the conventional basics, like jumping, for example, a simple static squat jump or something a little bit more dynamic like a counter movement with arms yeah it's it's awesome to see that you know flat screen just blow up what do you do for an encore in year three and year four when yep i see my my wattage or i'm seeing my uh sparta scan profile or you're seeing you know maybe uh you know some german software showing the force time curve in the segments i think it'd be really cool and i'll start off is to share how we're taking sports science and the data which is important and making it coaching friendly and then adding that twist of so the athlete isn't bored out of their, their minds and that's one of the things i think would be really important is because the number one thing that I, i'm seeing is that everyone wants to add data and science to their program but when the rubber hits the road you know you know a lot of stuff collects dust because there's a you know they're trying to get numbers and they're having problems selling it to the athlete, like compliance, for example. Um, so one of the things that we'll start off is uh, there's a, a brilliant speaker slash writer, and she does like anthropology for, for you know, modern times. And uh, 
her expertise is actually on gambling and addiction. She wrote a book on that. And uh, that's what it basically warned to me in saying, if I try to make things, quote, compliant, I'm going to lose. Because what that's doing is it's trying to keep the perspective of like, hey, this stinks. This is not fun. This is data. And you got to do it. And I'll find a way to make it a little bit more interesting. On the other hand, the addiction side, if you can tone it down, it's a lot easier to throttle down than to try to bring and resurrect things. So from an athlete user experience, and that's the, the term that I guess I've coined, is how to make the process rewarding, not just interesting and entertainment. Because anyone can go and get a flat screen and, and you know yeah. add some sound effects. Uh, that's kind of like candy. That's the dessert. What I think what needs to be done, and I've learned this from you know, some great coaches that I was, when I was in high school, is if the process is not rewarding, it's not sustainable. Because the eye candy, it gets old. You get sick and tired of the same, yeah. you know, Reese's peanut butter cups. So, you know, what we've been finding is that the approach of uh, trying to make it so that it's not just, uh, you know, nice little uh, badges and stuff like that, you know, or cool um, graphic user interface making the, the process more like, uh, you know, uh, you know, basically a, a reward for hard work. And to me, just getting that process and that paradigm shift away from that instant gratification. And the example would be um, uh, wellness questionnaires. Everyone talks about them. You can get them done with your Google Docs. It's cheap. Um, you're, you ha everyone has a mobile uh, smartphone now, so it's not like it's harder when it was just a you know, index card, but what do you do after they've answered the questions for three weeks? You know, that's 21 times they've asked sleep quality, you know, uh, soreness and all this other stuff, mood. What have you guys done to find a way to take not only the, the jumping and, and some of the vertical profile, but everything that you do so that uh, people that might not have access to a force plate or someone that doesn't even have a budget for an LPT can say, uh, if we're just doing old school, um, you know, like Vertec or even the wall with uh, some tape, well, that's not perfect. It gets the athletes used to that whole process. So when they go to college and do have more likely to have those those tools, um, it's just a great framework to have. So Jay, and then go to Mike, and then to Ryan um, to, to to basically wrap things up. Share what you are trying to do or currently doing. To make sure that it's not just, you know, kids feel like lab rats. They actually feel like Formula One cars that they're just fine-tuning. I think the easiest way to summate all of it is if it's not willing to drive a conversation, don't do it. Because who cares? You know, <laughs> um, if you're just going to look at numbers and you're not going to talk to the people that matter, uh, which are the athletes about it, and you're not willing to show them what the change is going to be, then who cares? Um, on top of that, if you're not willing to have it drive directly into what both the main objective of your sport coach and really what the athlete wants, again, it's, it's a waste of time. So if it's not going to drive those two directions, who cares? Just don't do it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think, like Jay's saying, the biggest thing is the why. You know, if you can't explain why you're doing something to the athlete, then, you know, ultimately, why are you doing it? And to be honest, the athletes are the easiest sell uh, for us with regards to buying into the signature. Um, and the reason why is because that's, this is how they were grown up. Like, they were grown up looking at their smartphones. They were grown up chasing numbers. So, you know, a simple thing as, I'll use the example of, multiple schools out here have like the fifties club for the Sparta scan in the weight room instead of one RMs. And it's really, it's really cool because when the athletes scan, like the first thing they want to know is they're going to, and like you were saying, Carl, it's something simple. And after three weeks is the honeymoon stage going to be over. Well, ultimately they want to know if they're squatting tomorrow or if they're working on, you know, let's say single leg RDLs for drive, because if they're squatting tomorrow, it could be because their load was low. So they want to know, did my load go up? And then why? Because ultimately, what's going to change is what I'm doing as a workout. So the athletes, it's been really uh, an easy sell. The, the harder part is, is coaches understanding that 
the software is just the blood machine. And then I'm not coming in and telling you what treatment you have to do. Ultimately, your program, you're already doing those treatments. It's just now we get to prioritize when and where and who needs what. Great, great answer. Ryan, uh, you're probably juggling the, the most uh, technology, uh, next to me, of course. <laughs> Uh, it's really it comes to that. I'm just trying to win games. I, I mean, that's all I'm trying to do. So Honestly, we're all trying to win, Ryan. But <laughs> it'd be really nice to show what the things that um, that that little nugget of of space that you're responsible for, such yeah. as the weight room mm -hmm. and all the, the the ways to to measure load. How do you make the experience not only with the the jump testing, because uh, obviously you are in sort of the honeymoon period. What have you learned from the past from other technologies or training mechanisms or techniques to make the impro the whole process woven in and embedded and exciting? And, you know, because obviously you're bringing some a lot of from your from your uh, pictures, you're showing a, a lot of excitement and some thunder. How do you bring uh, that type of uh, energy into the the day to day scanning, and and, and and how do you keep it so that they're they're motivated? I think the first thing you ask yourself is, as a coach, you know, what do you do when you don't have that? You know, what is your basis as a coach? What do you do when it all breaks down? You can take away the technology that we have. Jay knew me when I was at VCU and we worked together there. You know, the, the artist makes the brush. You know what I mean? The brush doesn't make the artist. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things where when I look at it, you're talking about the art of coaching. You're talking about the ability to establish communication with your athletes to help motivate them daily and, and in most senses to make them do something they really don't want to do when they first get here. They want to play basketball and they see the, the weight room as a, as a means to an end, so to speak, to understand it's something that I have to do. It's something that it's a part of the process, so to speak, but these athletes aren't process driven. Um, today's culture and today's athlete that I'm receiving is very, they want instant gratification. They're results-based. They want it now. They want to see it, and they need that continuous feedback over time. So in order to instill a growth mindset within these athletes, it's a day-to-day -day thing. Uh, we've added our technology in little pieces at a time because it doesn't distract away from what we're doing. If we come in and we had a tough game the night before, we're supposed to scan, but we need to change the environment and we need to change the climate and we need to go to work, then we're going to go to work. And that stuff's going to stay in the box and we're going to go ahead and do that. And there's times where that happens. Um, but you have to be able to explain to your athletes how to be a pro and how to be a pro now. It doesn't start when you're getting paid. It starts now. It starts in high school. And the more you can communicate with those athletes and show them their passion that I have for my profession, the passion my staff has for what we do is reflected in what we're trying to get them to do. Um, it's not an authoritarian type style, but we do have demands. We do have standards for which we need our athletes to compete at. But that's the art of coaching. Um, and that's the ability to kind of convey this message to your athletes and understand that, you know, when we track, it's not a means of punitive measure. And our guys can choose. You know, I have eight guys that do it consistent. I'll tell you that right now. We have other guys that give a pain in the butt and they don't want to do it and can't really reach them. Then that's fine. Then we have guys that use it and guys that don't. But it has to make sense to them. And it had, they have to understand the only way you can do that is if you can show them. Uh, in the summer, if a guy wants to know if he's getting faster, I can show him he's getting faster. We've instilled a competitive mindset where our guys are trying to compete on each given set and each given rep. Is it all sunshine and rainbows? No. Do we have issues daily? Do guys want to perform every single day and bring it? But you have to be able to make those adjustments. And the technology is just something that we're adding in, not only to create an excitement within our team because it does excite them, but they do get tired of it. Guys don't like putting on bros every day and putting it in and giving it back and then loading it through. I mean, it's a very monotonous process at times, but they know it's very essential to what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve. But that all starts where I learned this at a very young age. Athletes see right through you. They know, they know who you are within the they first five you. seconds they talk to you. No, they do. They know if you're full of crap. They know if you're just making them do something because they want it. They know about how the way you look, how the way you train, you know, how the way you conduct yourself as an athlete, how you conduct yourself as a coach. They see it right away. Uh, they're masters at looking at your character. They're masters at looking at are you in it for them or are you in it to get the notoriety and the fame and collect the paycheck every single week. If they need to come in on Sunday morning and you've been going for seven days straight, are you going to be there in order to be there for them? And I have the ability with only 19 kids to have great relationships with every one of those kids. But they're going to measure you up. 
I tell all the interns when they come in, they're going to test you. They're going to see what you say, how you say it. They're going to try to put you in a corner. They're going to see what you know. They're going to listen to what you say. They're going to try to go back and forth with you a little bit. And they're going to test you and they're going to keep you honest. And with my team, there's no hiding. Uh, and, I, and I want them to be like that. But they see it. If you're just buying stuff and you're trying to buy expertise and you think it's all sunshine and rainbows on Twitter and everything's great and there's no speed bumps. <laughs> everything's always good on Twitter. <laughs> and that is a lie. You put everything that you put out there on Instagram and Twitter, everything's perfect. That you, that's what you want people to see. Uh, but in reality, it's not like that on a day-to-day basis. We have struggles. I've had guys take off units or come in and get their force plate and they say their ankles tight. Whatever it may be, you find a freaking GPS unit behind one of the baskets at practice and you're wondering why a guy's not moving. I mean, there it is. It's there. Or they leave it in the locker room. Oh, I forgot. I mean, those are things you deal with on a daily basis. But the part of the nature is you got to know what you're talking about. you got to be able to explain it and make the information meaningful to them. You have to get them to buy in and keep things sexy, so to speak, but understand and explain to them that novelty over the long-term process. How can I develop you if I don't know what got the result in the first spot? Yeah, are you tired of squatting every week? Are you tired of doing some of the same stuff? Yes, but when you can show the numbers and they adapt to that process and they see the physical changes for what they're doing and the mental changes for what they're doing, I think it's an easy selling point. But overall, you have to be a coach. You know, it's the wax on the car. We already built the car. We just put a little wax on it. Uh, And I think that's something that needs to be understood with what we're trying to do. Uh, but I'm a coach at heart. That's what I do. Uh, and I think that's a part of the process that's constantly fluid and dynamic. But if you can't coach, they know you can't coach. Period. If, if you don't have their best interests in mind, they know. Uh, but establishing those relationships and then providing your staff with the people around you that have similar thought processes as far as how you approach the athletes is number one. Um, but those are things you have to learn as a young coach of how to communicate, and how to talk to people, and how to develop actual meaningful relationships uh, that really go long term because that's what it's all about. You know, you want an athlete that wants to do it, that wants to perform, that's invested in what you're doing. You don't want them just clocking in and clocking out every day. Uh, and I think that goes back to the coach, everything. Every great coach I've seen has the ability to explain things in a way to make them meaningful to their athletes, to motivate them to want to perform even when they don't want to. Uh, but that's a part of it you're not going to see on Twitter, you're not going to see on Facebook or Instagram. Those are things you only see when you're in there uh, and you're training with guys and you're developing. But what your athletes do when you're not watching and what they say about you is what you are. Maybe uh, share one resource or anything um, that could be good for the listeners to, to get more information specifically on you know, mainly the jump and power stuff. I know that for Ryan, I really like the um, the podcasts that you've done. Uh, maybe that's a, an idea. But for Mike, if you could start off, what would be a good resource for uh, listeners and viewers to to learn more about um, Sparta and what they're doing? Yeah, I think our, our blog is probably the main one. Um, that's where we kind of break down the, the publications and, and go from relating back to the, the practicality component. Um, you know, anyone can reach out to me directly, but uh, we're an open book with our research and and I know it's kind of hard to follow from afar, um, but I think the blog, you know, you can search like familiarization. It's a study we just did with University of Queensland that came out last fall about, can you coach up the technique of the jump, um, which they found that you can't. So that was powerful for us. Um, so yeah, just going there and then, kind of understanding it and feel, feel free to reach out to me too. Absolutely. Ryan. I think the biggest thing for, for coaches and professionals like is to find a circle of coaches that you respect, uh, that you trust. They're going to give you meaningful relationships as far as they're going to tell you how it is. If I call Landon Evans and I throw an idea by Landon, he's going to tell me if it sucks or not. <laughs> no, he is going to tell you, what do you mm-hmm. Like, you know, what are you doing? If I call Jay and I want to try this, or we're doing this in the summertime, he's going to tell me straight up, like, this is where you're at. So I think for me, the biggest thing I probably missed out when I was young is not visiting enough sites. If I call Bob Alejo down at NC State and we visit now, something I did when I was younger, I didn't. We went on road games and had home games. I didn't interact as much with those coaches and be as transparent with them as possible. But I have a network of people um, that I search out, that I go find, that people are doing things that I want to do and they've been doing them consistently at a high level over a longer period of time. You have to have those resources and those people that you can go to that are going to give you not what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. 
Uh, and I think from that standpoint, that's how you develop. And I think I have a fantastic circle of people that with Jay and Carl and Mike and Landon and, and Eric Corum and the guys down at Baylor and, and Brian Mann. And Ty, I, I can go on and on. And the guys that I know, if I have to call somebody, they're going to give me the information that I need to hear and the information that I know is going to help make a difference in our program. Whether you go to free lap or you're going to inside tracker on the blog, or you're going to visit CVA, uh, the central Virginia, and you're going down to Jay's clinic. The one thing about Jay's clinic is you can sit at a table and have an open discussion. And also too, just like the athletes, people are going to see right through you as well. Um, so I think for young coaches, it's important to understand, like truly understand and get in there and know what you're talking about, know what you're doing, and not try to impress people with your discussion or anything else, but to be open and transparent and honest with what you're doing. Uh, not to cue coaches to death by how much you can regurgitate and talk to an athlete and cue them. Can you show them, number one, can you do it? I can't jump 40 inches in the air, but I know how to teach it. I know how to coach it. And I've been a part of it. How many reps and, you know, and how much time have you really put in uh, to the profession? I think that's one thing. Moving forward, uh, we all need to share. We all need to pay it forward. Uh, we can't get sensitive and understand that questions aren't being attacked. It's a way to open dialogue and make us all better. Jay's doing a fantastic job of that with his clinic, with his blog. Carl, you as well. And sometimes, you know, you got to tell people what they don't want to hear. Uh, but in order to get better, uh, there has to be some pressure there. and You have to be uncomfortable. Uh, and I think those are things looking forward, young coaches, old coaches, go see coaches, go talk to them, go visit them. Uh, there's a lot of places where we're at, we can drive, we can discuss, but get on the phone. There's no reason not to get better nowadays. You have access to more people than we ever had in history. And they're only one click away. No doubt. Well, that's a, a tough, uh, right. tough to follow up with that. I think because you've addressed the, the, the art or the coaching side, to me, I'm going to create a little harmony by going into the, the science, which I'll just divide into the to the hardware and technology side, and the, then there's the research. I think with this, uh, I just remember uh, back in the 90s when I was using Netscape Navigator to try to find uh, information on sports science. To me, it was basically microfiche, and uh, I remember in college when I was just, you know, trying to find a, a research study, it took me like two weeks you know, they, they literally had to go and, and, and mail the, the journals because um, yeah. a lot of its stuff was not at our fingertips like you have now. So for the readers, I think that one thing to go is I, I just take any study from PubMed, and the first thing I do is add to the Google uh, uh, to the Google line is ResearchGate because a lot of this research, the whole study, not just the abstract, which people love to post on Twitter, is you read that and you you know you print it out. I'm old school. Highlight it. Drink it. You know, a cup of coffee in the morning and and hammer that. Then after you've read enough of the body of work, there's nothing wrong with me. For for me, is this basically politely reaching out? Sometimes these sports scientists are really keen to working with coaches. They're not in you know some sort of research uh, lab and they're. You know, there's mice running around and they're drinking from their beakers. These guys are engaged. They want to help us. So I think that's another important thing. Then on the other side, it's our job as coaches and professionals to communicate effectively with these companies. Um, at the end of the day, it's nice to have all this stuff in the, in the research, but then when you're trying to replicate it and put it into your own uh, environment, you're going to have to buy something. And... You know, I'm writing something up for Jay. I'm almost done. I do promise it's going to be mailed out. Is co a coach's shopping guide of how to make these decisions when you purchase uh, something like force plates and you have to do a presentation in front of your athletic director to say, hey, we have to drop more than uh, a few hundred bucks uh, of a just jump mat because there's a difference. Mm -hmm. So I think it really behooves us not only to get these sports scientists to, to speak with the coaches, you know, so there, there's a little bit of uh, uh, balance there, but also collaborating more so that these products and these companies can evolve based upon the feedback of the users. So that's me uh, speaking from a soapbox. Jay, uh, ninth inning, we're up by a run. Close us out, buddy. Should I play under Sandman or? <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Rivera. Um, <laughs> no, I, I couldn't agree any more with what Ryan said. Um, and he and I are kind of spoiled being in basketball because at the very worst situation, you're going to have an hour that day to talk with the, the strength coach when they come in for shoot around. Um, you know, next Friday, it's 
Matt's coming back down because G Dub's playing uh, at VCU. Handy will be in town because Mason's playing here. So I mean, it's it's a time for for four coaches to sit down and, and you know have a soda or two or whatever it may be, you know, and and, and just wrap. You know, I mean, it's that that's really what's important is, is going out and and talking to these people and listening to these people. If if a younger coach, what I would probably say that the best thing you could do is if you don't travel. Find out when a football team's coming to your city, and, and and go meet them and buy them dinner, man. Take them out and just ask a question and shut up. Like, I think it's all too often that that younger people like to jump in and kind of flex their muscles because you know you read this article or you read that article or or whatever. Um, nobody cares, you know. Joe Ken. The greatest piece of information that I, honestly, that I may have ever gotten is Joe Ken told me once, nobody cares what that person said. What they care about is what you think about what that person said. How do you interpret the data? How do you interpret the study? How do you interpret their work? You know, if I wanted to go talk to somebody about what Natalia Vorkoshansky does, I'm not going to call somebody else. I'm going to call Natalia. I don't need you to tell me what Natalia's going to tell me. You know, I don't need somebody to tell me what Buddy, uh, what Buddy's going to tell me, or what Louis Simmons would tell me, or what any of you guys would tell me. But maybe Ryan's interpreting something that Carl does a little different than I did. You know, so maybe Ryan's impression of it would be what would be most important to me. Awesome. The other thing, <laughs> the other thing, Hank said the other day, and I mean Hank's. He's he's the best. Find the oldest stuff you can and read it. Because you're going to learn two things. Either what the stuff that has survived forever or the mistakes people made before. So why would you make those again? And it's like, you know, that's one of those things when he said it, it's like, yeah, it's, it's so simple, but it, it makes complete sense, doesn't it? You know, yeah. the the older information there's gems in it. There's things that you're going to find in stuff that's going to be printed next week. But there's also things that won't be, and there's mistakes that coaches are still going to make because they didn't read that old stuff. So I think those would probably be my two. 15 seconds, real quick. You talked about that. I remember back, Tim, uh, Jim Rooney. Remember Jim? Mm -hmm. uh, he's, uh, Jim gave me the old Soviet sport reviews, and I have all of them in this big, giant binder that you have to go yeah. get. I know everybody thinks about different things now that's new. I think you guys talk about reading and sharing information. Well, use it. I think that's another thing that I see. Get in there and use it. Does it work? Or it don't live in this hypothetical land of does it work. That's why I love Louie. Louie waits for somebody else to prove him right. He's going to do it and then go from there. And I think those are things that we have to look at and try to move forward. But, yeah. No. All contenders, no, no pretenders. No doubt, man. Guys, this was killer. I really appreciate you taking the time out to be with us today. Yeah, I appreciate the green day. Yeah, yeah thank you. Day. Yeah, yeah. thank you, guys. Yeah, no doubt. Have a great one, guys. We'll be in touch real soon. Thanks. Bye. Appreciate it. Thank yep. you. See you, guys. And a huge thank you to all three of our guests for taking the time to be with us today, guys. I like I said, this is a different avenue that we're kind of exploring. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. I mean, open and honest sharing is, is what all of them are all about. I mean, obviously, if you look at Sparta's webpage, I mean, it's the blog. They, they don't hide anything. And everybody knows, you know, Carl's not going to hold any punches when it comes to talking training. And Ryan Horn, is, he's putting stuff out every day, so you can actually look into his weight room and see what he's doing. So it's, it's three people openly, honestly sharing how they're using technology. So I, I hope you guys took something from it and you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, thoughts, or comments, guys, though, tweet them at us, leave them on the Facebook page, leave them below, either on the Podomatic page or on the Central Virginia CVA SPS website. Uh, if you enjoyed the roundtable type discussion, too, please let us know. If there's other topics you'd like us to cover in this realm, please let us know. This is something we're exploring. I think that it could be really good, but I want to make sure that we're given the information and, and providing the platform that, that our listeners and coaches want to hear. So if this is and you enjoyed it, please let me know right away and, and we can start looking at 
building off this and, and doing more of these. And as always, thank you for being a part of it, guys. I, I hope you did enjoy this talk as much as I did, and we will be back next week with another awesome guest.